Welcome back to Insomniacs. This is episode two. We're really excited. We've got Jason Driscoll on. Um, we'll get inter- into introducing him here in a minute. Um, again, my name's Mitchell. Um, we've got Cliff, our advanced sommelier. We've got Misha on as well. You know, and so we just are really excited about getting this episode going. Um, but first, let's kind of talk about some news. Um, there's a lot going on in the world. Um, and so we just kind of want to bring to light some of the things that are going on um, as far as locally in the state of California. Um, I'm sure everybody's seen on their social media all their favorite restaurants that they're doing to go. But what does that mean? Um, a lot of restaurants aren't even aware that they're allowed to really sell alcohol to go. Um, the state of California, as long as you are a bona fide restaurant, type 47 for those that want to geek out on the licenses, uh, you can sell wine and beer to go, um, as well as can sealed up pre-cocktails. Um, no ice or anything included, but you can sell those cocktails to go for those kind of licenses. Uh, That doesn't automatically mean that if you were a bar, you can change your license to a Type 47, so you have your food packages included in there. Um, But just really look into uh, the possibilities of what you can do to support your local restaurants. Um, Times are tough right now, so we really want to make sure that everybody involved in this industry is really getting the support that we all want and deserve. Um, So if you have any other questions, you know, log into the California ABC website. They've got tons of resources to be able to look that up. Um, So just shout out to that. Um, Another thing that I think that really is interesting um, that we really want to point out again back to our local restaurants is what as bad as this crisis is um, and all of you can probably point out you know in a minute that uh, it's also bringing a lot of people together. Um, Restaurants are giving back to food banks, chefs are redonating their time to people in needs. Tons of people in this industry have lost their jobs temporarily for however long we don't know. Um, so it's great to see that camaraderie and back to the community. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Misha, have you seen that? Yeah, it, it's definitely starting slowly. There's some bigger players that are doing what they can to help. Um, and we'll see how that gets distributed out there. But it's encouraging to see the, the businesses, the, the restaurants, you know, their suppliers uh, come together. So, yeah, good start. Good start. And again, this is just as far as locally California that we know, I'm sure nationwide um, it's going on as well. And, you know, there's a lot of people that can definitely support. So, again, follow your social media um, and see how you can, you know, contribute. If anything, just eating to go. Uh, So with that, we want to get into it again. um, I'm going to let my co-host Cliff uh, reintroduce himself and then Misha. And then let's get into the main star, Jason Driscoll. Cliff, want to reintroduce yourself to everybody? My name is uh, Clifford Burr. I um, am the input specialist with the Estates Group and uh, lucky to be working with all these fine gentlemen. Uh, also just passed my advanced sommelier two weeks ago, just in time uh, before uh, I wouldn't have been able to travel. So yeah, that's, uh, lucky. that's about what I do. Yeah. That's me, uh, awesome. Misha, you want to be, tell yeah. everybody? Your, uh, Misha Johnson, fine. Uh, fine wine team, Central Valley, Tahoe, all over uh, California. And, uh, you know, fellow wine spirits beer enthusiast so great and uh so the little drum roll for our uh, guest speaker this is jason driscoll everybody he is the owner uh co-owner with his wife hillary for uh, uh, driscoll wine co um and tilth wines so uh, jason thanks for coming on with us today i'm guys thanks for having me Cheers. you know we're really stoked um we're hopefully you're excited to join with us and um you know talk about some wine talk about your passion um, yeah man so it's something that I definitely think everybody wants to know, and it's kind of one of the basic questions, but uh, how did you get into wine? What got you into this crazy, uh, you know, ne- uh, nectar of the glass? Huh. Kind of think about that every day, but uh, uh, I didn't go to school for it. And I, you know, I wasn't 18 years old and studying chemistry and winemaking and all that. I kind of fell in love with wine later in life. Uh, I went to school, I, I studied culinary arts and politics of all things. Uh, but I wanted to be a a chef and I kind of fell into the winery in a cellar job. And, um, I just loved working with my hands. I really fell in love with the production aspect of it almost before the actual consumption of wine. Um, and that is 
that's truly what I'm passionate about to this day is cellar work, you know, breaking down building pumps, uh, working in the vineyard, learning as much as I can in the vineyard. Um, I love working with barrels. I love cleaning things, which is really weird. But you have to have kind of a screw loose to work in the cellar and be passionate about it because you spend a lot of time there and certain parts of the year. Um, I like to kind of compare it to restaurant work, uh, full time, like restaurant work is harvest all year round. I feel like though, cause restaurant work, they're working 12 hour shifts, 365 days a year. Uh, so I have a lot of respect for, uh, the restaurant industry, but, um, but yeah. And then after I, I started in the cellar and worked my way up, uh, I then really started falling in love with the consumption of wine just by introduction of wines through people I was working working for. And I started learning about wines outside of Napa Valley because I was mainly making Napa Valley wines. Um, and only recently in the last three, four years have I really kind of obsessively dived into um, outside of America, so imports. Um, okay. And I, I feel like a student still and I love it. And um, I, that's why I admire you, Cliff, for what you're doing. I actually, I said this on a meeting uh, uh, recently that I, I signed up for WSET 3. So I'm right. going back to the basics and I'm, I'm learning all about the uh, wines of the world. Um, and I'm falling in love with it again. It's like you constantly have to educate yourself. So, you know, and hopefully it shows in my wines. I mean, my wines are not consistent, as you guys know. Like every year they change a little bit. And it's because I'm learning something different every year. And uh, I kind of think that's something that's exciting about what we're doing. Because uh, you guys kind of follow along on our, our on our journey. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's funny that you uh, brought up, um, you know, that going into the W set. And I know Cliff uh, and you did a blind tasting on Instagram Live. Um, but Cliff kind of wanted to bring in some of your culinary background experience and some questions that he had for you as well. Yeah. Kind of bring... Yeah. So, uh, Jason, so um, what was more nervous for you? Was it uh, being on Instagram Live doing a blind wine? <laughs> or uh, making your first wine <laughs> being on instagram live <laughs> <laughs> no um may, um well, i think if i heard you right you it went out a little bit but um was was it the other was making my first wine yeah i was kind of more tongue in cheek but it, that it was, was a fun having you on yeah oh man you threw me off and you gave me so many chances too thank you so much <laughs> i got it wrong about 10 times <laughs> um but yeah, no, I, I making my first wine was it was terrifying. I can imagine. So I've got a few questions. So um, you know, I I I think we all like to uh, cook, but you obviously went to culinary school. So um, how do you bring your chef experience into what you're doing in the cellar and winemaker? Are there any connections, or is there any sort of parallels that you could make? Yeah, I, I think well, there's a couple of parallels. One is that I'm not overly educated, so that's the most basic. Is that you use basic ingredients in the kitchen and i think in the best kitchens you use the most basic ingredients because you get really good ingredients and you kind of stay out of the way as cheesy as it sounds that's a lot of the kitchens i worked in were like that very simple um but i'm not over educated in that i don't have a degree in, in science or any of that so i think that helps me because i don't necessarily know exactly what's going on and i'm willing to take more risks um i think it limits people when they think too much and and dive into the the data a little too much um and i think having a kitchen background certainly makes you a little more playful um uh, willing to try new things i think everything has generally been dried so i'm not you know reinventing the wheel but um uh, it has certainly helped in my sort of um i don't know it's helped with my palate and helped the kitchen experience is, as you guys know i don't know if you guys have worked in the kitchen but Sure. Uh, it can be playful. It, it requires organization. It, it also just requires you to have, you know, a sense of taste. So, so my feeling of uh, like, uh, um, you know, working kitchen, creating recipes is, you know, you, you don't want too much salt. You don't want too much of this. You don't want anything to stand out. And I kind of think that with winemaking too, I, I don't know, but you know, you don't want too much oak. You don't want too much tannins. You want that balance. So, you know, it's kind of that sensory experience all around. Yeah, you want the salt to elevate the the steak. You don't want to taste the salt. Exactly. Want, That's yeah. Good. Misha, would you agree with that after your time in the kitchen? Yeah, I, I would absolutely. I had a question for you, Jason. So your first uh, commercially released wine was Zinfandel, right? Yes. So 
it's my least favorite varietal. It's an ongoing joke. Um, mostly, and here in the Central Valley, there's a lot of Zinfandel. I don't like the overly oaked. I don't like American oak for most wines, and uh, I'm not big on on ripeness, sugar, you know, residual sugar specifically. So, um, how is it making a Zinfandel as a chef, you know, and and starting there, what what was the reason for that? You know, the reason was more sight and more affordability. Um, you know, I, I was working in the cellar at Honeycut, and I I was kind of looking at site sampling a vineyard for somebody. And it was up on top of Mount Canucti, head trained vines. I had no idea what it was, but I talked. His name was Michael Fowler, Devil's Kitchen Vineyard, and I said, "Dude, I like I would love to buy this fruit from you." And it was only a couple tons. Uh, turned out it was Zinfandel, and like I said, like I, it was more production focused for me. Like I just wanted to make something and create something, and it just so happened to be Zin. And uh, I, I really loved Pinot. I wanted to make Pinot. Pinot is so expensive, but Zin is a thin-skinned variety, so it can be elegant. It can be delicate, um, and I struggle with that every year because vintage to vintage, it's a, it's such a pain in the ass to pick at the right time. But because of, you know, big clusters, you have variation and berry ripeness and acid levels, you can lose acid like that. But uh, the first year, I, I, our 14 year, we had our finished wine was a 3.6 pH. So I had plenty of acid for a Zin. Um, and that was kind of the way, the direction I wanted to take tilt was sort of make, you know, fresher style of Zins. But vintage to vintage, you know, our 17 is a is pretty big. <laughs> right. But um but you know, it's it's a constant goal. You know, with Zin specifically, I, I you know, if you make a fresh Zin, man, it can be awesome, and you can pair it with foods. But you let it hang for one day longer, you're kind of screwed. Mm -hmm. Struggle. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. That's uh, all good. Thanks, Jason. So, Jason, um, before we get really into grilling you about your production and the wine and your vineyards and everything that you're sourcing from, what are you doing when you're not making wine? Like, what do you, you've got a young family, your wife is involved in the business. What are you guys doing? Um, well, when I'm not making wine and not like selling wine or, or trying to, to, to sell it, cause I hit the road a lot uh, late, obviously right now, everybody's kind of hunkered down, but I, I just spend time with my family. Like my son's in little league, my, my little daughter, uh, Ellie is ballet and, um, we should, hang out with kind of hermits you know when you have little kids it's you kind of hang with your family and then you hang with other fam other people that have kids the same age and you go to sports and I play a hell of a lot of basketball now uh, just because my son likes basketball so I'm constantly uh, playing I'm horrible but um, it's you know I just kind of that Jack dunk move though right I mean with your height I mean you're dunking it on oh, I got ups watch out no <laughs> no I don't <laughs> You're but, right there with Cliff and Misha, though. I mean, both of them have young families as well. And I mean, I, I, I'm assuming both of you can attest that, yeah, when you get home from a long day of work to have that work-life balance, right? Uh, it's it's very important. Today is uh, supposed to be opening day, by the way, for baseball. Go Mets. <laughs> I knew it. Um, yeah, man. I, I'm missing Little League for sure. I'm I'm glad. It's not officially canceled and looking forward to um, football is actually supposed to be on. I, I got the message from our schools that, uh, you know, summer camp will still happen supposedly. So that's exciting. Oh. That Good. Very, very cool. cool. So I got a I got kind of a nice uh, tie in there. Another uh, question I was uh, wanting to ask you, Jason. So, um, you know, you, your family, young kids, and um, you started this uh, venture and I'm sure, um, uh, you had a lot of support from your wife, Hillary. So I just kind of wonder how she played into it and, um, you know, what, what her role was as far as supporting the uh, the starting of TILF. Yeah, so from the start, Hill kind of supported me in, you know, working in kitchens and, you know, it wasn't exactly a, a selling point when I asked her father for her hand in marriage when I was a cook. Um, but uh, so she's kind of sacrificed a lot to follow me in, in those days, which were really hard. And then when I started TILF um, and it started working out because I had to kind of prove that this was going to be something. She She's always been supportive from the start, but it was like a kind of breath of fresh air, like, wow, we can do this. And she kind of dove into it. It went from being 
you know, full-time mom, because we had really little kids at that point. So now they're going to school. She, I mean, I make the wine and yes, I'll hit the road and sell it, but literally everything else, and there is a lot to running a business, is Hillary. So this is her desk, actually. <laughs> okay. And I'm in our bedroom right now. So, but um, no, so she she's like, she does our accounting. She does, you know, she keeps in contact with our distributors via email. It's all of our, our order processing. So it was difficult in the beginning, though, um, yeah, working sure. with, with a significant, with any significant other um to learn each other's kind of it's like dating again because you're not you're not like we weren't married in business so um it was really uh interesting it turned out to be good for our relationship though to learn how to work with each other did she uh did she like drinking wine before you got going on this or was this all kind of new um she loved drinking wine she she loved Ram rombauer and you know which isn't uh, uh, we got to be careful what i say well it's a great it's a great <laughs> wine and she she loved it she loved like kind of big more um i don't know just approachable wines and then now we're drinking chablis we're drinking burgundy like cause we're, we're we're kind of getting out there so it's nice anything i take home she drinks with me we love I, i've talked to you guys about this before though if we don't have a bottle of champagne at least you know three times a week something's wrong she loves absolutely. champagne absolutely so kind yeah. of break in, you two then as a joint team decide on the name Tilth. How'd you guys have the name Tilth come into play? Uh, yeah, we, yeah, it was it was definitely everything. Everything we've kind of when it comes to names and stuff like that is a, is a discussion. Um, but Tilth was uh, it, you know it means cultivated soil. And I actually came across that Devil's Kitchen Vineyard. I was walking uh, with my boss at the time, Dave Desanti, and we were talking about Tilth. So I mean, this, he said when you drive into a vineyard and you step out and he was talking about scouting vineyards he said the first thing you feel under your boots is soil and the first thing you talk to the grower about is soil and their soil health and what they do and you know is it organic is it biodynamic you know what do they use so um i don't know that kind of stuck with me i thought it was kind of cool also one syllable driscoll was taken trademarked so but yeah well i think it's i get a, a lot of slack for that well, you guys are doing fairly well with it, I think. And that actually kind of brings it into your vineyard sourcing. You don't actually own any vineyards. You get the luxury of going and selecting what sites you contract and work with, correct? Yeah, I get to, I, I, no, I'm not gonna, I would love to own a piece of land, don't get me wrong. I mean, when I can, I, I will. When that day comes, I can't wait. I hope it comes. But, um, but it's kind of cool to be able to source your own ingredients, you know, like like kind of going back to the kitchen, like f seek out, have a relationship with your with your grower, and um, and I get to have a relationship with guys. Like I love going to Lodi and talking to Jeff Carlegos, you know. I love talking to Ron Black over in Russian River. But these these guys have they're all characters. They all have their own stories, and uh, I think they grow awesome fruit. Uh, they're also willing to work with me, and they're great with my family. And you know, it's it's just a positive vibe all around. So. I really enjoy sourcing fruit. Yeah, Amisha, you just got back from um, an experience a couple of weeks ago here, where you were actually out in the vineyards doing some pruning and everything. What do you have any questions as far as vineyard work that you've got for Jason? Uh, just one thing I noticed in the valley in, in Napa. Um, so I was there, what three weeks ago, and bud break was super uneven, um, and I believe Cabernet was one of the the later ones um to get going right you have yeah. anything to tell me about i have a little bottle of your your chardonnay here can you tell me about where uh, chardonnay is in, in its season of growth and, and vine development all that yeah so chardonnay actually has started um bud break um so it starts a little earlier here at least in our vineyard and it's a little um risky because you got to worry about frost with that so oftentimes people we don't like in our vineyard it's all pruned it's it's already it's too late started bud break but people often keep their canes kind of high they they'll, they'll half prune to to delay it as you guys probably know that so you know they'll prune sort of hope for, to to pass the frost season and prune then but um uh yeah we kind of take the risk and manage frost with with windmills and fans and sprinkle so 
Um, but yeah, that's the process we're in right now. It's kind of just, it's quiet now, but yeah. How do, how do you feel about all the, the lack of rain that we had for February and what do you think about the season coming up? I'm not terribly concerned yet because it's been, you know, it's not, people think when we get like a dump of rain, it's, it's a, it saves us. And that's actually, you know, that's not necessarily beneficial at all. So we've had some, over the last week, we've had slow kind of trickles rain, which I think is really positive. Um, it's definitely benefited from that. So uh, I'm still hopeful uh, that we'll have a good season. We're really spoiled where we live because I can maybe think of one bad vintage in the last 10 years or one really bad vintage. I mean, we've had mediocre years, but uh, we've had a really good pattern going, uh, even in the even in the drought years here. So, yeah, so far so good. I mean, and it's supposed to, it rained yesterday, it's supposed to rain again today, but it's been kind of dappled. Jason, you want to, um, I know Cliff has got some questions for you for some of your varietals that you've been known to kind of do some really cool experiments with, but can you talk real quick before that of the um, varietals that you have currently out in the market? Yeah, out in the market, uh, we have a Pinot Noir from Russian River from Tina Marie Vineyard. Uh, we have a Chardonnay from Napa Valley. It's from Ragushi. Um, we have a Sauvignon Blanc from St. Helena. Uh, we're talking about out in the market right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, just kind of give a little bit of feedback of the vineyard sourcing, you know, kind of stylistically each one of your wines, you know, how you're kind of developing them right now before uh, Cliff wants to get into some of the fun stuff that you've got going on. So every wine uh, that we make for Tilth is sort of a blend of, of different vineyards mostly. Um, and they are a blend of our experiments and our kind of bigger lots. Uh, I just want to make a, a take each variety, each core variety. So we're gonna have you know Cabernet, Zinfandel, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and just make a fresh kind of exciting style of it. I'm not trying to make a super funky style, but I want it to be represent me and also represent where it comes from, um, which is you know difficult, but it just requires you know kind of light guidance, light touch. Um, and I think I also think that's a benefit of not having an education too. Is like I don't know how to manipulate these wines, <laughs> you know. I don't have access to the technology, so I literally, you know, I add minimal amounts of sulfur and occasionally we'll add yeast. Uh, but most of our wines are made without inoculating and just kind of a fresh style. And they change vintage to vintage. We don't have a recipe. We don't, you know, it's just part of us. Very exciting. Um, so with that, yeah, Cliff, uh, you got you had some other questions on varietals and product that Jason's got. Yeah, going on. yeah, a combination of you know, I know, I know you started with Zinfandel, then there was a Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot, Chard. So, um, you know, any other stuff in the pipeline or anything really uh, funky experimental you're doing? Yeah, so I uh, I make a I did a Carignan uh, from um, Poor Ranch Vineyard up in Mendocino. I harvested this year. Uh, we got five tons. I put it into an open top tank. And I took bisqueen and I put it on the top, dumped a bunch of dry ice in there, sealed it. So we did, uh, we tried to do a true carbonic uh, fermentation with 100% whole cluster, obviously, um, uh, Carignan from Mendo. And it took about <laughs> 30 days, but it finished. Whoa. So that was a fun experiment. But yeah, we do uh, you know, a little. What are, the what are the barrel samples like of that so far? They're good. They were really funky when when I pressed it because we pressed directly to barrel. And um, but it, it's come through as it went through Mallow. It kind of we did our first racking two weeks ago, and now it's kind of it's coming together. So that'll mm -hmm. actually that'll go into our California Zen. But yeah, and you did a uh, Valdegate too, right? I remember that last year, two years ago. Yes, I don't want to get my hopes up, but I think I'm getting back into that vineyard. So, but yeah, Valdegui is super exciting to me, um, or Napa Gamay, but. Um, it can be really fresh. A lot of people hang it till, you know, 28, 29 bricks and they'll blend it into Syrah here or they'll blend it and other things kind of stretch it out. But when it's uh, made fresh on its own, it can be super fun and kind of mineral driven and, you know, great acidity. It's a really good for food. But yeah. I remember tasting that Valdegay from a couple of years ago for yours and it was absolutely delicious. Um, so hopefully you get back in that vineyard. Oh, I'm stoked. Oh, yeah, and, and Cabernet, you guys haven't had our cab yet. Uh, that's still in barrel, but we're doing Star Vineyard Rutherford uh, Cabernet, trying to make a, you know, nice, fresh Napa Valley uh, Cabernet. 
but yeah, that's that's got a ton of grip right now. So that's going to be in barrel for a little bit longer. It's 2018. So awesome. Hey, Jason, sure. what, what's your guess on uh, approximate like retail for that Cabernet when it comes out? Because all your wines are, are super affordable um, and true to their you know varietal and appellation. So how about that Rutherford? I'm going to try to hit the $50 price point. Okay. So, or seven hundred dollars, you know. Either way, you guys let me know. <laughs> but uh, no, on the I, secondary black market. Yes, yeah, on the secondary. Yeah, there's a high demand for it. Yeah. You were no, I mean, Happy Van Winkle. Yes, yes. No, everything we we make, we try to make it so that we can afford it, and uh, you know, on a on like a daily basis sort of deal. And I'm not saying people can afford a fifty dollar bottle of wine on a daily basis, but I think it's a good deal for Rutherford. Um, but yeah. No, I'm, I'm having fun with it, and and we'll see if we. I, that's going to be our price point. So yeah, awesome. So with what you got going on right now, some fun side projects. I know you're also kind of working with some other wineries, getting some product out for them, and you've now can become their consulting winemaker as well. Correct? Yeah. Anything you want, you want to elaborate on that? <laughs> so <laughs> sorry. I'm really good at this. No. Um, <laughs> I have a couple clients. Um, one I help a little bit with uh, is uh, Willamette Valley Vineyards. So they have a project called Natoma, and it's a tasting room over in Folsom, I believe. And um, they have a whole keg system. So I've been kegging wines for them, uh, making making kind of their California wines to go into that project. They also bottle a, a Napa Valley red wine that we make and a, a Napa Valley Chardonnay that we make. So that's a cool little project. It's fun to see they're they are so organized and the winemaker talking to him on the phone, you know, they're a big brand, but they make really fresh, good wines. Talking to that guy, he is awesome. Again, no, he's got it all dialed in. I we have like a couple thousand cases, and I feel like I'm running around like a chicken with his head off. And they have like a hundred thousand cases, and he's just like this chill, never loses his cool guy. But um then I have another project with uh Bill Davies. Um, and he's kind of all, you know, natural wines. We're making Chenin Blanc, we're making Val de Guis, and we're doing a uh, Carignan from Buddha's Dharma Vineyard up in Mendocino, uh, which has been a, it's been a learning experience for me because I, I like to think I, I lean more natural, but you know, I, I, I love sulfur. I use sulfur. I think it's good to have sulfur in wine, but this like Bill really wants to go, like he pushes it, the boundaries. So it's taking me out of my comfort zone, but yeah. That's really cool. Um, it's cool to see that. Uh, I mean, you call yourself uh, very new into the business, but obviously if these other wineries are seeking you out to get some collaboration going, you know what you're doing. Um, so I, I would definitely just fun. definitely hats off to you for that. Thanks. Uh, Cliff, did you have any more questions that you had for Jason here? Yeah, before we sign off, one question for you, Jason. So I, I, I was looking at a picture of you and the boots. Are you Rossi or are you Blondie? Ooh. I'm Blundy. I uh, have I'm Rossi, Rossi though. <laughs> For those hey, who don't know, uh, they're, the, they're the winemaker boots of uh, Australia. Every winemaker wore them when I was there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We got that. that it's split here in the valley too. You know, between you know Blundy and and Rossi. Hey, before yeah. we sign up, can I ask you guys a question? Yeah, have yeah. it. I got to do it. I got to ask. What's the the most interesting bottle that got you guys kind of excited about wine? Can you remember the first bottle? That just stoked you out. I was gonna say I know a Ooh. bottle that got me pretty stoked last summer, but uh, what? Yeah, <laughs> that 1990 to Kim that we all shared at camping. Misha talked about oh. it yesterday, and that was still one of the favorite bottles that anyone's ever shared. Uh, so cheers and thank you for that as well. Yeah, that thank you. I, I so, still uh, have energy on that. So uh, to your question, though, um, I remember when I was, uh, you know, in, in England, we do drink a fair amount of wine, but uh, I was over at a friend's house. His dad was in the uh, import business and uh, I was 17, 18, uh, Sunday lunch, and he brought out a bottle of uh, Chateau Talbot, Saint-Julien. Can't remember the vintage, but it was probably like, a, it must have been like a 76, 78. I wish I knew the vintage to try to find it. But uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, had the roast beef, he opened, he decanted this bottle of uh, Chateau Talbot. So it's kind of like, I was like, wow, I didn't know wine could taste this good. It was like, you know, just maybe the whole pairing, but that was kind of when I realized there's some, there's more than just a, you know, two pound uh, 
Riojas out there, you know? So yeah, that was probably mine. That's awesome. It's a good memory. Um, for me, I mean, I grew up kind of just being kind of in the wine industry out in El Dorado County. I mean, riding a bike show in Carsberg to Park during Passport Weekend. So I've always kind of had the itch. I just didn't really know how I was going to start. And luckily, uh, some of the winemakers up there kind of just took me under the wing. And that's what happened for me. It wasn't really a bottle specifically. It was more the people. Yeah. What about you, Misha? I, I was already going in the wine business, but um, when when I really knew there was exceptional wine out there, I was at uh, En Premier 2010, so it was the, the nine vintage, and the, the Sa Blanc at Chateau Margaux was just dumb good. And I, I was like, wait, you have a $110 Sauvignon Blanc? And I, I didn't think that Sauvignon Blanc could be anything but, you know, innocuous grapefruit, light water. <laughs> and uh, that really opened up my my eyes 10 years ago. So, uh, yeah, Chateau Margot's is, is definitely a soft spot in, in my heart. <laughs> SB, man. Hell yeah. Yep. I, I can drink a lot of SB, and, and Jason, your tilt SB is awesome as well. Thank you. I was fishing for that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but currently I'm going with Chardonnay. I, I did want to know, um, is this 100% Mallow? How'd you make this bad boy? Yeah, that's 100% Mallow. Uh, we pressed uh, directly to barrel, actually, so it's on gross lees. It's pretty um, funky ferment. Let it go through, cleaned up naturally after about 30 days uh, again, because we didn't have any yeast. But um, let this year go through Mallow, because last year we halted Mallow, and it was just, it was a style I like, which is super acid driven, but I don't think it showed enough fruit um, and sort of secondary characteristics. So this year I went with that. And then next year, we're going to add a little bit, like a dabble of new oak, just a little bit to see what that, see that lifts the palate a little more. But uh, so that will be my third year making Shard. But every year we're kind of adding something that kind of, I'm learning with Shard. But uh, 18 is full mallow, no new oak. And I think it's still really fresh and shows uh, Napa fruit the way it should be. Awesome. Um, yeah, it, it's delicious. I, I still get the oak notes. I mean, it's. It's a well-balanced wine for sure, and I think for the price, it's dynamite. Great awesome. job, thank you. So before Misha talks about the wine he's drinking on too much here, as we all close out, um, one big last question that I really have for you, Jason, and you don't have to have a hundred percent answer for us yet. Um, um, your winery and where you and Hillary really want to take it. I mean, you're at a certain level now. I mean, do you see yourself becoming a hundred thousand case winery and then selling off to a bigger company, or do you guys want to? keep this small and in the family, you know, where, where do you see you and the, the company going? Um, I, I want my own production facility. I, I want my own wine. Like we want our own estate, our own winery. Um, and I kind of want to, this is a long-term business for me. Yeah. I like, again, I, I think I found something that I actually really am passionate about, which, uh, I think if you do, uh, stick with it. <laughs> I don't want to get distracted and do all these different things. Like I know I love winemaking. I know this is something I want to do for a long time. So the best thing I can do is take this business and see if I can eventually get a loan on a piece of piece of land or or, or a production facility and and make our own wines there. But I have no case goals. My goal is to grow with you know the demand. But I certainly want to be able to you know. I mean, my dream is like walking to work. You know, having my kids run around on the land with quads and stuff, clean while I clean the press, and you know, have customers come in and want to taste our wines. But um, that's going to take a long time to get there. But uh, but yeah, I guess the dream is just to have a small estate winery and have you guys distribute it. But um, but yeah, we're getting there. Awesome. <clears throat> I mean, I'm super excited about your story, and I appreciate you coming on and talking to us. I know these guys, Cliff and Misha, um, are as well. Um, so one of the things that we really want to start doing with everybody is talking about what we're drinking while we're talking. Um, this is all just a fun conversation. Misha, I'm going to let you go first since you've already brought up and intro and queued yourself up for the tea on that one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much more I could talk about it, but 2018 Tilth Napa Valley Chardonnay, it is darn good. And I'm lucky that I snagged a bottle before we got locked down. <laughs> so very happy. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, man. Cliff, what are you what are you sipping on over there? 
Well, I would be sipping on toast, but likewise, could not get my hands on a bottle. So I am drinking a, uh, a Riesling, Margaret River, from uh, Lewin Estates. Ooh, how is that? It's it's really drinking well. It's a great it's a great uh, it's a great wine for this time of day. What vintage you got over there? 2018. So it's okay. Margaret River, Margaret River, and yeah, it's it's I need some oysters. There you go. Absolutely. Um, Jason, you're gonna go last because your bottle is pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> I got the 2014 K Vintner Syrah from Morrison Lane. Um, drinking really well actually still right now. Lower alcohol than what I kind of assumed it was gonna be. Um, but yeah, still holding strong, good silky tannins, nice little kind of chocolate mocha. Um, really happy with it. And uh, so Jason, you've shown that bottle off. What do you what do you got over there? Legend that it looked like? We got a Ridge Estate Merlot. Uh, it is young though, it's 2017. It is robust, but it is beautiful. Um, this is my first time having Ridge Merlot. Um, I was really excited to join their wine. I don't, I'm not in any wine clubs. So I start like, I. You know, I'm sitting around here, so I'm joining wine clubs. <laughs> but the uh, end, why are you joining wine clubs? It's just fun to be a customer, man. I don't know what it's like. You know, it's it's cool to see how people treat their customers, and then I really enjoy this wine. It, I I regret opening it because I think this can go a really long time. But it is a beautiful wine. I wanted a blind cliff on it, but <laughs> now you know. We'll do that another time. Yeah. No, this is great. So I I recommend it highly. To sorry guys it's ruined it but um but yeah no i recommend it very very cool well uh, since you uh, seem to have some place to be or someone else to talk to uh, <laughs> is there, is there uh, any kind of way that people can reach out to you you know social media handles uh, email um contact you to buy your wine from your winery from you directly um yeah how can we get in touch i mean i'm Pretty active on Instagram. Uh, it's at Jason Patrick Driscoll or at Tilth Wines. Um, or you can email me. I mean, it's Jason at DriscollWineCo.com. Um, that's the easiest way to get a, get a hold of me. But I'm yeah, we have a website. What's up? I'm assuming you have a website as well. Oh, yeah, DriscollWineCo.com. <laughs> I'm really good at the marketing thing, guys. <laughs> Perfect. But yes. well, um, again, I appreciate you coming on. Cliff, Misha, um, hopefully you guys are just as stoked about it as I am. Um, any final questions for Jason before we have him sign off? I'm good, thank you. Good to thank see you, you again, buddy. Good we to need see you guys. guys. Hang out soon. Absolutely. Awesome. Cheers. So with that, that's uh, episode two. Um, I just want to say cheers to everybody for coming in with us um, and joining us to talk to Jason. Um, again, we are Insomniacs. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and um, we post all these videos onto our YouTube channel. That's Insomniacs with two M's. Um, I know we've had some confusion on that. Um, so if you guys are liking what you've seen um, and hearing, you know, leave some comments in the video um, boxes. Reach out to us on social media, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we really look forward to hearing from everybody um, so we can keep getting some really great guests on. Um, our next guest, we're going to be talking with some winemakers and wine owners down out of Lodi, um, the clinker brick. So looking forward to that next episode. Um, and with that, cheers. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you.